Amen. Very good. Let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to John chapter 1. We'll start in John chapter 1 and then uh, we'll move on to some other books of the Bible. We're going to be in about three books of the Bible tonight. We're going to be in John, we'll be in 2 Peter, and we'll be in Luke as well. Uh, Just some different verses uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, Tonight's message is entitled, Having Grace and Truth in Our Life. It's based on, obviously, the fact that Jesus Christ is the one who brought grace and truth into this world. Uh, When you look at John chapter 1, let's look at verses 14 through 17. So John chapter 1, starting at verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you again for the day you've given us. Thank you for the restful afternoon. Thank you for another opportunity to be in the Lord's house. Father, I ask that you would please bless our time together, allow it to be fruitful. Lord, help us to glean from the word of God. Help us to hear you as you speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, guide us according to your will. Uh, Father, give us the discernment, the wisdom that we need, the understanding. Lord, help us to walk in the truths that you set before us. I pray, Father, that Each and every one of your people would have a heart's desire to live for the Lord, to glorify you in every area of their life. Lord, help us to do it. Give us the grace to be able to do it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as John pens those words right here that are so true in verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, right? God gave the law to his people through Moses, but through Jesus Christ was grace and truth. Obviously, the law that was given through Moses could not help anybody. It condemned. It showed the sinfulness. It showed that a sacrifice had to be given uh, just often uh, for the sins of the people. But when Jesus Christ came, obviously, he brought grace and truth. And if you're in John, go to John chapter 8 just as an introduction to even look at the fact having grace and truth in our life through Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, we see an account where a woman will receive the grace of Christ as well as the truth. In John chapter 8, starting at verse number 3, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him, to Jesus, a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now obviously they were tempting Jesus, They want to know what Jesus would do. But obviously Jesus is the word. He is the judge that shall do right. And in verse number 6, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So he gives, he puts basically, he puts the ball back in their court. First they come to him, they bring this woman caught in the very act of adultery. Uh, they, they throw her in the midst of the crowd and they ask Jesus, you know, what are you going to do about it? Because the law of Moses condemns her. And the law of Moses did. I mean, the law condemned her to death. But obviously she is about, she's going to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, in verse 8, again, he stooped down, row in the ground. And they which heard it being convicted, uh, convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. So obviously not one single person cast a stone at her because they were all convicted because of their own sin, because of their own shortcomings. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. There's the grace. She received grace, though the law condemned her. But obviously Jesus Christ is grace. He's the one that uh, is able to forgive and able to pardon. And he says, Go and sin no more. And there's the truth. The grace, 
She's not condemned. She's forgiven. But the truth is, she's to go and sin no more. She's not to do anymore what she was caught doing. And see, and that's the grace and truth that all of us have received in our life through Jesus Christ. The grace, the mercy, the pardon for our sin. But then he wants us to walk in truth. He wants the truth to bear out in our life, to, uh, to, to lead us in our life. He wants us to live by the truth of his word as we have received his grace. Now, we're in John chapter 1. I want you to look at verses 1 through 4 as we get started. I want us to see the exhibit of grace and truth, how it is exhibited to us. In John chapter 1, uh, looking at verse 14 again, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Obviously, Jesus Christ being full of grace and truth and being able to give that grace to each and every one of us. Now, in verses 1 through 4, we want to see the grace that obviously delivered life. I mean, grace is is what we do not deserve, but we have received. We have received grace by his forgiveness. We have... Our sins pardoned, our sins are paid for, all right? That's grace. We're receiving something that we do not deserve. And in verse 1 through 4, we see grace and truth delivered life. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And obviously by the truth of God's word, and by his grace, we have the life that we have. Now, if you were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All right, God, again, God's the one that has given life, and he's given it by, very graciously, by grace and by truth. Again, because his word is true. Now, I know there are some that probably uh, hate their life. They wish they had a different life, but we all have the life that we've been given, And wherever we're at in our life, God wants us to blossom. God wants us to bloom. God wants us to grow right where we're at for him. He wants us to obviously exhibit his grace in our lives so others can see the truth of Jesus Christ, that the life that we have, as Paul said, by the grace of God, I am who I am. Every one of us are exactly who we are. We may want to be somebody else. We may want to be somewhere else. We may want to be doing something else, but God's given us this life, and it's by grace that he has given it to us. Look at verses 4 through 9. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, the light being Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, John obviously declaring he's not the light of the world, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So not only have we received our life by the grace of God, but we've also received light. Grace and truth has delivered light into our life. He's the true light. Now again, John the Baptist was sent to just herald He was to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ. And he had that day, that famous day, where he finally was able to say, Behold, the Lamb of God which has taken away the sin of the world, as Jesus approached the river Jordan where John was baptizing. But again, Jesus is the light. In verse 8, in verse 9, That was the true light which lieth every man that cometh into the world. Now the light, you think about just the light that we have. All right, we have life. But then light. Everybody is wandering in darkness without the light of Jesus Christ. We have no idea where we're headed in our life without the light of Christ showing us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, I mean, you you go back to day number one, and, and God divided the light from the darkness hath shined in our hearts, just as he divided the light and the darkness, commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So again, you think about this concept of having 
grace and truth in our life, the grace and truth of Jesus Christ obviously giving us life, but then bringing light into our life so that we see our sinful condition, we see our need for Jesus Christ, and we see that, you know what, he's the only hope that we have. Again, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Nothing else can shine in a person's heart to show them the truth except the light of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone and you've tried convincing them with Scripture that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by Him. You've tried to convince them Jesus is the answer, and it's just like nobody's home. They're just not getting it. Without Jesus Christ shining in their heart, without Jesus revealing himself to them, they're not going to get it. The Bible even says that, the, that preaching is foolishness to the lost. But to those that are saved, it's the power of salvation. I mean, God's people love hearing God's word. And it's because the light has shone in our hearts. There's something within us that shows us and testifies of the goodness of God and shows us what's in our hearts and shows us our needs. Look at verse 10 through 13 of John chapter 1. He was in the world, speaking of Jesus, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Obviously, being born again by the Spirit of God, being born again through the Word, hearing the Word of God. Obviously, you know, God has given every single person life, but the life that he's given is a life that is to be used to obviously come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ for salvation, the light of Jesus Christ by his grace. I mean, uh, just even thinking about my life, just the grace that God has shown upon me that even though in a time in my life where I kind of rejected God and walked away uh, from truth, yet he didn't give up on me. He allowed somebody to be instrumental in my life where they would talk about the things of God and God was shining his light into my heart, showing me my need. Though I knew religion and, and, and knew some things, yet it was all a head knowledge and he showed me that it wasn't in my heart. Because lots of people know the truth, but they don't live the truth. They don't believe in the truth, yet they know it. Yet the light of Jesus Christ shows us the love of God, shows us the love of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Again, the life that he's given us, the light of him shining in our hearts, and the fact that we have his love all testifies of the grace and truth that have been delivered to us. His grace and truth that abide in us. Again, I know every one of us in this room have, except for maybe some young ones, you've experienced the grace and truth of God in your life. You've experienced God's mercy. Because again, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. We all have received mercy. But you think about the grace, the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, I want us to, to think about just the expression of truth and grace in our life. In 2 Peter chapter 3, now we have it, but how often do we submit to it? How often do we submit to the truth that God has shown us by his grace? In 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according, <clears throat> uh, let's see, also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned 
and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, when you think about just the expression of the truth and grace of God in our life, think about the fact that we need grace, we need God's grace in order to submit to the truth of God's word, to submit to the truth of God's word in our life, to what God has for us. Again, as Peter says, there are some, even in our day and age, there are some that, you know, they twist the scriptures, they wrestle with it, you know, they struggle with it to their own destruction. Again, uh, I mean, just one, one of the verses that always comes to my mind that people struggle with is found in Hebrews where the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Talking about God's people assembling, coming together for fellowship, for worship, for praising God, for hearing God's word together collectively, corporately as a body of believers. And yet there are many people that struggle with that, and they, and they, and they, they really they twist the words because fleshly it's not what they want to do, all right? And that's just one example, but I mean, there are so many other examples where the Bible tells us, uh, you know, feed your enemies, right? Those that do you wrong, you know, be good to them. And some of God's people have a hard time with that because, you know, some people can just be downright cruel, mean, and nasty. And, and humanly speaking, you don't want to be nice back to them. Uh, you kind of want to, you know, twist the golden rule and, well, and, and you want to do unto them as they've done unto you. But obviously God tells us not to. God says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we teach kids that. We teach our kids that, that, okay, you know, they were mean to you. They took something from you, but don't retaliate. Don't go back and, and do that. Do something nice. Uh, be, be nice. And in the flesh, that's hard to do. That's why we need God's grace. We need God's grace in order to submit to the truth. In Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, this is, again, this is Paul on the road to Damascus. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Listen, it's hard for thee to get, kick against the pricks. Now, Paul thought he was doing God's service. He thought he was defending his faith. He was defending what he believed in, but obviously it was against Christ. And he, he came to Christ, and he met Christ head on on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, if you were to read on, he submitted to Jesus. He didn't resist anymore. He was resisting it, not realizing he was resisting God. But once he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and was confronted with it, he submitted to the will of God because you read on and Jesus says, or Paul says to Jesus, what would you have me to do? He submits, all right? And it's only by God's grace because who came to Paul and stopped him from destroying any more lives? Stopped him from even destroying his own life because he was on the road to destruction. Not only was he killing people, but his own life was going to be shortened. His own life was going to come to an abrupt end because it always comes to an abrupt end when you don't have Christ in your life. And Jesus, because of his grace, came to Paul and stopped him. And by God's grace, Paul listened and he turned around and he submitted to the truth that, you know what, I am kicking against the pricks. He, he realized by the grace of God that he was going in the wrong direction. He thought he was going in the right direction, but by God's grace, he, 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 focused, he realized that he was going in the wrong direction. Look at verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 17, <clears throat> the Bible says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. One of, one of the dangers of being familiar with things is being familiar with things. Again, when you think about those that were in Nazareth that knew Jesus and saw him grow up in their town, they were offended at him. 
They were offended that he was proclaiming to be God, though he is God. And even though he healed some people, a few folks, yet the rest of them were offended because they knew him as the carpenter's son. They knew, they knew his half-siblings, his brothers and sisters that were there, and his mother, and they were all offended. But the Bible says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. We need God's grace in our life so that we remain steadfast in truth. We need the grace of God in our life to remain steadfast in truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, the Bible says, this is Paul speaking, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he was speaking of his apostleship. It was only by God's grace that Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. He had been given that apostleship. By Jesus Christ, he had been given that ministry to take the gospel into the Gentile world, to the Gentiles, and and that's who he ministered to. He goes on to say, in his grace, Jesus' grace, God's grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Now, see, we need God's grace to remain steadfast to the truth. Because, again, when you have a life like Paul had, Paul had a hard life. And you know, I think, again, sometimes those that, that have a hard life serving God, many will give up. And many will think, well, you know, this is not fair. This isn't what I bargained for when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought, I thought my life would be a bed of roses. I thought, you know... Uh, the bank account would always be full. There'd be no problems. But no, uh, Paul had his problems. Uh, Paul even talked about his own struggles. The things I would do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. Talk to, he talked about his struggles. And obviously, we, we have a glimpse of his life, of the, the hardships that he had. People that were against him, that he thought were his friends. He, he mentions people that turned their backs on him. Uh, those that would, would leave him and and go into the world, so to speak, because they loved the things of the world instead of the things of God. And Paul needed the grace of God to remain steadfast to the truth that God had called him to a ministry. God had called him out of darkness. God had given him a new life, the light of Jesus Christ. I mean, you want to talk about the light of Christ shining in someone's life when you read the account of Paul On the road to Damascus, the Bible clearly says that the glory of Jesus Christ shone brighter than the noonday sun. Now, we know what the noonday sun, the brightness is. And and just about everybody in their lifetime has tried staring at the sun to see how long you could stare at the sun before you know it hurts your eyes. And uh, Think about, I mean, just the fact is that his, his brightness, the glory of his brightness was brighter than the new day sun, that it blinded Paul for three days. He lost his sight for three days. And the fact is that when Paul received his sight, the Bible records that scales fell from his eyes. I mean, only by the grace of God, he even received his sight again. What I'm saying is that we all need the grace of God to remain steadfast in the truth to remain steadfast in the service of God, to remain steadfast in following the Lord. Because again, the devil's always, he's always got his arrows pointed at us. He's always, he's always shooting his fiery darts, wanting to hit a weak, a weak point in our life, wanting to, to destroy our life. And as Jesus told Peter, sift us. He wants to sift us like wheat. He wants to destroy us. And when we allow the grace of God to work in our life and move in our life and to keep us steadfast to the truth, the truth is that God's given us this new life to live. And his light will guide us just like it guided the wise men. We have the light of God and it's the word of God, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We have this light. We have the love of God in our life that allows us to keep moving forward because we know that everything that that happens in our life happens for a reason and it happens because God loves us and we also look at verse 18 we also need God's grace uh, not only 
to be submissive to the truth, to follow God's leading, to follow God's word, but to remain steadfast in the truth, steadfast to what God's called us to do. But we also need the grace of God to mature through truth. Look at verse 18. Uh, go back to 2 Peter. <clears throat> Actually, you're probably there. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. But grow in grace. It's talking about maturity, our stature. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. We're, we're exhorted to. We are encouraged to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You know, a lot of people will give up on their life because they're no longer strong. Mentally, spiritually, they're no longer strong. They, they've allowed themselves to become weak because they've tried living their life on their own. I mean, you think about even just the prodigal son who got to the end of his life. He's in the pig pen. He's thinking about eating the, eating the slop, the, the husks of the corn. Because he's gotten to a place he didn't think he would ever get to. And I'm telling you, it's the grace of God that allowed him to remember how good he had it back at his father's house. Because you know what? You think about this. You think about the prodigal son, but then you think about King Nebuchadnezzar. God warned him. Warned him, don't stand up in pride. Don't stand up and think that you've built Babylon. God has allowed it to be built. God's allowed that to become a great nation. But you know the account in the Old Testament that Nebuchadnezzar walked, uh, walked throughout the palace. He looked upon the sea, looked upon Babylon and said, is not this Babylon that I've built? And God warned him that when he did that, he would turn into a wild man. And he would, he would be dethroned. He would be chased out for seven years. And the Bible records that for seven years, he lived as a wild man. He lived as a beast, eating the grass. I mean, his hair grew long, his nails grew. I mean, just everything God warned him would happen, happened. But the end of seven years, by the grace of God, he came to his senses and realized, you know, God is God. The life I have, the kingdom I have, is only because of God. You know what? Even the heathens don't build their own kingdoms. It's by the grace of God that God allows it. It's not that God builds, you know, communist countries and stuff, but it's only by the grace of God that, that those people are still living. It's only by the grace of God that anybody has breath. But as God's people... We have to remember that it's by God's grace that we can even grow and mature in the truth of Jesus Christ, as it tells us. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and again, as Paul is about to head off the scene, and he's passing the baton, the spiritual baton, uh, to his son in the faith, to Timothy, he says, Thou therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Every one of us have the life that God's allowed us to have. Everything we have is by the grace of God. You have your senses today by the grace of God. You have your mind by the grace of God today. The ability to be able to think and to, and to uh, relax, <laughs> to be able to think, to be able to uh, to be able to move, to be able to have any mobility, to be, just be able to live life. It's all by the grace of God. I know some people are not happy with their life. Some kids aren't happy with their life. But the life you have is a life that God's given for you to live it so his grace and truth will show out in your life. So that he can, through his grace and truth, build you up mold you and shape you into who he wants you to be, but we have to let the grace of God help to mature us. Take your Bibles, look at 2 Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and five through 7. Because you're talking about maturity, I mean, it's, it's growing. 
We have kids in, in this auditorium that are young and they're growing. They're growing physically. They're, they're growing intellectually as they're learning through school. And obviously as adults, we've, we've stopped growing in some ways, but we'll never stop learning. And God doesn't want us to stop. God wants us to keep growing. God wants us to keep growing in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-7, through the Bible says, And beside this, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. God's wanting us to continue to grow in these areas. We're to be, excuse me, adding to our faith. Sometimes, you know, we may get to a point, you know, where we don't have brotherly kindness to somebody for one reason or another. They did something, they said something, they offended in some way. But yet we remember that Jesus told Peter that we are to forgive 70 times 7. Remember Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother who, who's mistreated me, who's done me wrong? Seven times. And obviously Jesus said no, but 70 times 7. Because obviously we remember the grace that we have received for the wrongs that we've done, and we are to have grace towards somebody else. And really the only way we can, obviously we can't do it in the flesh, but we can do it in the spirit by remembering that God's given us grace, God's forgiven us, and God's given us room to repent. He's given us room to make things right and to allow others to have that same grace. I want you to look at Luke chapter 23. In Luke chapter 23, I want to look at a couple of different verses that deals with the experience of grace and truth in our lives. Uh, Luke 23, I mean, this is a, a wonderful example of somebody who experienced the grace and truth of Jesus Christ at a very important moment of their life. In Luke 23, when you look at verse 39, uh, let's see here, in the wrong chapter. In verse 39, it says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. You know, there's a lot of people that have that mindset that, well, if Jesus is God, then I want Jesus to do something for me. I'm in a pickle, and I want him to get me out. I'm between a rock and a hard place. I want him to turn things around for me. Again, this is a criminal hanging on the cross, two, two criminals hanging on the cross on either side of Jesus. They both are, are saying things. They're both condemning Jesus as they're condemned. And the one says, if thou be Christ... Basically, get thyself down from the cross and save us. Get us off the cross. If you have this power, if you have saved others, if you have, if you have risen the dead, if you've cleansed the leopard, if you've given sight to the blind, if you've helped the lame to walk, then get us off the cross. Not that he's believing in Jesus, but he is mad. He is, he's full of anger. He's hanging on a cross for a crime he committed. And we look at verse 40, but the other, the other malefactor, the other criminal answering rebuked him, rebuked the other criminal, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly. Now you read the whole account, again, both criminals, both criminals are cursing Jesus. But something happens in one of their hearts, and it's the grace of God. Because you've got you to remember that as Jesus is hanging on a cross, it's not like the pictures that you see. It's not like the paintings. The Bible says that Jesus was marred beyond recognition. Because they, they ripped his beard out, they scourged him, 
They smacked him on the head with a reed. They, they shoved a crown of thorns. They said, you looked at him, you could not recognize that it was a man. And here's somebody, by the grace of God, their heart has been turned. A hardened criminal, someone who was cursing Jesus, someone who was right along just mocking him and all that, but then something happened in his heart because you know what? He realized, <laughs> I'm not getting down. He realized, my life is at, is at the end. And he realized he did not want to leave this life without the Son of God, without Jesus Christ. And he says, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. This man's done nothing amiss. Truth leads to an honest admission. When you submit to the truth, it leads to an honest admission. This one man that we don't know his name, yet he was dying for the crimes he committed, yet the grace of God, the light of Jesus Christ shined in his heart. The truth spoke to him. I mean, when you read the account, Jesus wasn't witnessing to him. Jesus wasn't saying a word. Because you know what? He doesn't have to say a word. The Holy Spirit does the convicting. Convicts the heart. You imagine the, because of the love of Jesus Christ shining the light into his heart so that he sees his spiritual condition. Everyone knows their physical condition. Everyone knows that, you know what? They're a sinner. People know that they do wrong. Even those that are rioting, those that are murdering people, they know they're doing wrong. Those that are aborting babies, they know they're doing wrong. Those that are committing adultery and affairs, they know they're wrong. Everybody knows they're wrong, just not everybody will admit to it. But they know they're wrong. And here this man admits to Jesus the truth that he's wrong. Truth always leads to an honest admission when you allow grace through truth to work in your life. You know what? God says to be careful that you don't deceive yourself. People will try to deceive other people, pretend that they're better than what they are. And they'll try to do it by condemning the other person to make themselves look better. But obviously, as we see in our account in Luke 23, this criminal allows the truth of who Jesus is to lead him to admitting that he's a sinner. Again, when you look at verse 41, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. He knew that he was getting what he deserved. But this man done nothing amiss. He recognizes Jesus of who he is. And the verse 42 to 43, and he said unto Jesus, this unnamed criminal, yet Jesus knows his name. That's the most important person that you want to know your name. Lots of people want their names to be recognized. They want people to know who they are. Movie stars, football players, basketball players, I mean, there are certain names that when you say people, oh, I know who that is. No one knows who this criminal is, but Jesus knows who he is. And guess what? On that day that he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom, that criminal's name was written down in the Lamb's Book of Life for eternity. Notice he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What a wonderful truth. The fact is that he received grace, being forgiven, being received into the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ being his Lord and Savior, but also hearing the truth that today you'll be with me in paradise. Truth leads to a heavenly access, the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So when you think about having grace and truth in your life, you think about the fact that because of the grace of God, the truth of God, he's given you life. You have experienced his love in your life. You've experienced 
his light often shining in your heart. Now, obviously, on the day of our salvation, his light was shining bright in our heart to show us our need. But the days after our salvation, he has shined in our hearts to show us our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our bitterness, our unforgiveness towards others. You know, it's all by God's grace that God even shows us what's wrong in our life. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Nobody wants to know that, you know, wants to, their faults to be known. But you know what? Because God loves us so much, he wants us to know who we are. He wants us to remember that by the grace of God, we're even the children of God. That he's even given me this life to live. And he's given me his word to be able to have, to read, and to hide in my heart. He's given us the ability to say, Abba, Father. I mean, just think about the grace and truth that God has allowed into our life. And we'll continue to allow it into our life. Don't ever neglect the grace of God. Again, grace is receiving what we don't deserve. None of us deserve salvation. And none of us deserve the love of God. None of us deserve the forgiveness of God. But because of his love, we have his grace. But we don't want to take advantage of his grace. We want his grace to be in our life. We want him to guide us and to lead us. We want him to show us when we're wrong, show us where we need to be right, where do I need to lift up Christ in my life, where do I need to exemplify others, where do I, how? And it's through his truth. So don't, don't neglect the grace of God, don't neglect the truth of God. Now, some people only want the grace, they don't want the truth because the truth hurts. And sometimes the truth hurts when God speaks to us and shows us the things that are wrong. But he's showing us because he loves us and he wants to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So again, be thankful for the grace of God. Recognize the grace of God and allow the truth of God in your life to grow you, to mold you, to shape you into who God wants you to be and live your life exactly how God wants you to for his glory and for Jesus Christ to be, obviously, lifted up among others. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for just the truth of your word. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Lord, so many examples in the Bible that we can look at where you have shown your grace. You've given your grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But, Lord, one of the greatest places to look, if we want to see the grace of God, is in our own life. We have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the truth that you've given us. Father, thank you that, Jesus, again, Jesus Christ, he is grace and truth. Father, I pray that we would continue to, to, to follow Christ, continue to allow you to work in our life. And, Father, as the piano begins to play, I pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts. I'll give you a few moments alone in prayer. And as the piano begins to play, let me encourage you just to spend time in prayer asking the Lord. Have you neglected his grace? Have you forsaken his truth and not allowed his grace and truth to guide you in your life? Because again, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is the grace, he is the truth in your life. And many times we, we kind of neglect him, we ignore him until we need something. So allow Jesus to be the one that guides you and leads you. Allow his grace and his truth to work in your life.